Well, good morning and welcome and thank you for joining us on this Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, a joyous occasion on the Christian calendar and for us Christians, but without the, without the resurrection there would be absolutely no hope for us at all. Just one short announcement that uh, there will be no Wednesday Word this coming Wednesday, but we will pick it up again on Wednesday the 14th of um, April with a study in the book of 1 Thessalonians, what should the church be doing? What is the role and importance of the church? But today we're thinking about the resurrection and I'm reading from Mark's gospel, which we've been looking at these past few weeks. Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 8, Jesus has risen. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus and Salome, brought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, and had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee, and then you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the woman went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. At the end of our short talk today, we will do a communion service. So if you want to pause it at this point and get your communion elements, you're more than welcome to do so. Paul said that if what I've just read were not true, then it would have been impossible to have faith in Christ. Well, let's put it in his words. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 17. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. And that is why the resurrection is so critically important to the Christian faith. It's like a pack of dominoes. If the resurrection isn't true, then the rest of the things we believe all fall like a pack of cards. But we have very good reason to believe, compelling reasons to believe, that the resurrection is true. That all the available and reliable researched evidence points to, to the fact that the resurrection is true and that we can believe it. So there is no doubt that Jesus really did die. When the Romans carried out an execution, it was professional soldiers who did it, and they made sure that the person really was dead. In fact, one of the soldiers struck a spear into Jesus' heart just to make sure. And then there's no doubt that Jesus was buried. A man called Joseph from the town of Arimathea with a friend took the dead body of Jesus and laid it in a tomb carved out of rock. And a huge stone was rolled over the entrance and a guard was posted. And so Jews and Romans alike knew that Jesus was dead and buried. As far as they were concerned, he was well and truly out of the way. And then, of course, came the terrible shock that the body was gone and the tomb was empty. So what happened to the body of Jesus? That is the key question. What happened to the body of Jesus? Did the Jewish leaders or Romans... Uh, the authorities of the time, did they maybe take the body? If they had, they would surely have produced it when the friends of Jesus claimed that he was risen and alive because six weeks after these events, Peter and the other apostles appeared in the middle of Jerusalem and they started preaching the gospel and they started saying that Jesus, in fact, had risen from the dead. And all the authorities, be they Jewish or Roman, had to do was to produce this body. Now, of course, it would have been a decomposed, rotting body six weeks on, but it would have still been recognizable. All they had to do was pull it out the tomb, go and plonk it there in the middle of the marketplace in Jerusalem and say, see, what you're saying is a load of nonsense. There's the body. The problem they had is that there was no body to reproduce, and they knew it. The tomb was guarded by soldiers and the disciples were broken and frightened people. There is no way that they would have risked their lives proclaiming Jesus was alive 
if they knew that what they were saying was a lie, if they knew that all the time the body actually was still rotting away. So if the body of Jesus was not taken by his enemies, and if his body was not taken away by his friends, then there can only be one possible answer to that question, what happened to the body of Jesus? And that is that God raised him from the dead, that God raised Jesus from the dead. If it's true that Jesus rose from the dead, then this is one of the most amazing news items the world has ever heard. It must then mean that there is a God after all, because only a supernatural God could do such a thing. It means that Jesus really is his son. It means that God has accepted the sin-bearing death of Jesus as, a, as an atonement for sins on our behalf. And it also means that his death on the cross did not finish him off, but that he is still alive today. And that therefore it is possible to be touched by his life and by his influence now. If the resurrection is true, it means that we don't go out like a light when we die, but that we are designed by God to know him and to enjoy him forever and to spend eternity with him in his home in heaven. It also means that it is so very important that we get to know him now while we can so that we can be assured of our presence with him in the afterlife. And finally, it means that we don't need to fear death. Death is the final frontier that we human beings have to go through. It's the final challenge, it's the final hurdle. But we don't have to fear death in the way that we once did. Because we believe now in the words of the Apostle Paul who said that to depart, in other words to die, to depart and to be with Christ is better by far. And so now we face death with certainty and with hope and with confidence. Let's pray together before we come to our communion service. Lord, we thank you for your great rescue plan of salvation. We thank you that Jesus is not dead, but he is alive that he lives now at the right hand of God in heaven forevermore, and that now it is possible to know you, that the penalty of sin is removed, that we can enter into relationship with you, that we can know deeper within our own hearts and souls that we have eternal life. Thank you so much that you have done this for us. And be with any person who is still wrestling with these things, is still uncertain of their relationship with you. Lord, Draw them to yourself. Help your Holy Spirit to show them their need of you and to turn back to you through Christ. We pray these things. Amen. And now may I pray a prayer as we come to the communion. Merciful Lord, we do not dare to come to your table trusting in our own righteousness, but only in your great mercy. We are not fit to gather up the crumbs under your table, but your mercy is everlasting. Grant, therefore, that we may eat and drink by faith to be united to him and he to us. And so hear us, merciful Father, and grant that we, receiving this bread and communion wine, in accordance with your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ's holy institution, to remember his death and suffering, may share in his most blessed body and blood, who on the night that he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it. And in remembrance of me. Amen. I'm on my own today. Debbie's behind the camera. She hasn't run away from me, not yet at any rate. So if you've got your little, bit, your little piece of bread, it stands as a symbol for the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith and with thanksgiving.
The grape juice is, of course, a symbol of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you and for me. So drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. I'm going to close as we, uh, and if you'd like to join me at home, you're more than welcome to do so, as we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining us. God willing, we'll see you next Sunday, the 11th of April.